Hello. So in a previous episode, we've seen that fertility rates remain very high among especially the least developed countries, which are growing very fast in terms of their share of the world population. And so one approach that helps us understand these decisions is the microeconomic household model. This model goes back to the 1960s when it was part of the so-called new home economics developed among others by Gary Becker, who won a Nobel Prize in part for his work in this area. I'm going to use a bit of Gary's terminology, although it does strike us as being a little strange for the most part these days. And in particular, the idea is that the demand for children in developing countries comes from two kinds of sources. The first has to do with the reasons we usually think of for parents wanting to have more children. Namely, it's a wonderful family experience. And so in this new household model, they thought of that as like a consumer good because it's something that brings happiness and satisfaction. And rather than something that's only happening now, it happens over time, over your life. And so they thought of it as analogous to a consumer durable, which you have to pay something for, but you have lasting benefits of enjoyment as a result. So they thought, well, the first two or three children might be consumer goods and thought of in this way, but additional children might be thought of in, as investment goods in the sense that the children are helping you by working on your farm, um, perhaps eventually at another job. Um, and so that is really quite um, an important factor at some point. Um, perhaps working for your microenterprise, um, very common. And then last, related to this investment goods idea, is this old age security fertility motivation. In developing countries, least developed countries and other low income and some lower middle income countries, there's not a social security program of some kind so that if you're to be taken care of in your old age, it will have to be by your children. And so this is another factor. And this is the basic framework. And so then we can just write this down in symbols in order to see what the relationships are. We have a um, a function here that tells us how many children the family will want to have. Of course, surviving children becomes a factor. The number of children you want in your family, as you say, start out your family, depends on a few things. One is the level of household income. And if you just think of numbers of children as being the good in question, as income rises, you want to have more children. And of course, this is related somehow to the Malthus model. And so it's going to get some um, attention. But the issue here that economists have found is that indeed, families spend more income on children when income rises. There's just a positive relationship between um, income and the amount spent on children. The difference has to do with how much you spend on each child. This original theory referred to it as child quality versus child quantity. So that when you have the opportunity, you may prefer to have two highly educated children who got their BA or BS from GW, rather than 20 children who are not educated. So that's the idea here. P is this net price of children. So of course it costs a lot to raise a child. In fact, in developing countries, it costs a fair amount also from the point of view of being a family possibly living in poverty. The net price of children is where this investment good idea comes in. It costs less to raise a child if, on the other hand, the child is contributing to income by helping work on the farm. PX, that's the price of all other goods. If the price of all other goods um, were to fall, that relative to the price of of uh, raising um, uh, children, the family might be expected to substitute into other kinds of goods, like perhaps family vacations or a fan for the house or something of that kind, um, if those prices relative.
fell in relative terms. And so that then finally we have tastes or preferences. What are people's underlying preferences for wanting to have a bigger family with numbers of children or quality of children also if you want versus other possibilities like travel and so on. So this is the basic framework. And then just to pursue this further, if we want to think about utility maximization, the following hold, we've got at some of these points already, but this summarizes it in terms of the relationship. The higher the household income, the greater the demand for children. And what we've seen is that in practice, when families have an opportunity to spend to raise quality of children, rather than just have more children, they will tend to do so. So that's what we understand by demand for children more broadly. The higher this net price of children, the lower the quantity demanded, the higher the prices of all other goods relative to raising children, greater quantity of demand for children, and finally, the more people prefer to have children to spend on their children out of the income that they have available, um, the, they, the more they spend on, on children and vice versa. If people prefer furnishing their house and going on trips rather than having more children or investing more in their children, they will uh, do the latter. They will have fewer. And so in the theory of fertility based upon microeconomic analysis, there's a few implications. You expect the fertility to be lower in a number of cases. One is which more female non-agricultural employment is, av is available and at higher wages. So here the notion is that the main opportunity cost of raising children for women in developing country families is that they cannot go out and get work they are focusing instead on raising children and productive activities that they can do at the household. So this is non-agricultural employment, which is often at higher productivity and at higher wages. So that's the main point of, of opportunity cost. And so just as a bit of a look ahead, this is all related to policy implications. If you want to have lower fertility, if you want to lower fertility in a place like Congo, one important way to do so is to have higher female employment opportunities. Related to that raised women's education, women are more aware of different alternatives that they may not otherwise be, but also when women are educated, they are more productive and then they have a greater chance at getting this kind of employment and getting it at higher wages their role so that in society women are thought of as not just mothers but also as perhaps professionals and then status which has much to do with decision making power the fact is that when you do surveys of families in developing countries typically the husband will want to have more children on average than the wife the difference on average might be at most one, but that's enough to make a very big difference. Even an average difference of a half, which is just an average, of course, you can have half a child, but let's say half the, in half the families, um, the, let's say that the husband prefers um, one extra child compared to the wife, that also leads to a pretty big difference in overall fertility. So other things are expanded schooling opportunities um, and with lower real costs, by the way, for children. This enables families to substitute from quantity of children into their quality. Increases in family income levels, which does the same. It takes away from the importance also of even thinking about children in their role as providing income for the family. Reduction in infant mortality and better health care. One important factor here is that if a family targets having a larger number of children because they know, in part, some of them may die, but there's a good chance that one of their children may die, they'll have more children and may not just have one extra children, they may be averse to that to the point where they may have um, three more children, at least possibly. 
And so that when there's better health care, this becomes less of a concern. And I put this um, last on this list because by the time the development of social security plans come into play, some of these other opportunities have also often been implemented, but this can raise the um, um, incentive to have fewer children also. And so there's some empirical evidence um, of varying degrees, but empirical evidence does support these um, implications of the model. And, though, and there can also be some other additional influences that are important and that empirical evidence suggests is important, at least in many cases. Lower prices and better information on contraceptives has been shown to make a difference. Policies that have the effect of reducing boy preference. We'll talk about boy preference in more detail when we look at health matters in chapter eight. But the notion is that if you have a preference for boys, then if you have a 50-50 chance of having either a boy or a girl with each birth, then if you want to have a boy but you have a girl, you're much more likely to keep having children. And indeed, one way to test for the theory that there's boy children is to see if it's more likely that the last child is a boy than a girl. And there's a thought experiment, if you want, an exercise on the, um, on the um, exercises and discussion questions uh, four that asks you to consider a case. And you can think about this. Suppose you had, as a kind of stylized model of this, every family wants a boy. They're very happy to have a boy or a girl if they come along, but they want to have a boy. And so they're going to keep having children until they have a boy and then stop having children. Now, in that scenario, if the chance of having a boy or a girl is 50-50, will there be, in the end, more boys than girls, more girls than boys, or about the same? And so that's what I would like to ask you to think about, and we'll come back to that later on. So that also direct incentives, including subsidy benefits, if you have fewer numbers of children, has also been found to have some effect. It's part of what was done in China uh, in terms of their one-child policy in the sense that although you were not supposed to have more than one child later on, there were some cases in which you could have two children, and then this was ultimately lifted. But even when it was even illegal to have more children, there were also incentives, namely, if you have one child, the child gets some very good education benefits. But if you have two, even the first child loses those benefits. So um, finally, social norms and fertility expectations can play a very important role here. And so in order to do so, I want to start by thinking about the notion of complementarities with its possible impact with respect to having, perhaps, multiple equilibria. And so in this regard, we can think about, on the one hand, on the x-axis, we can talk about the expected average number of children in the reference area, such as a group of villages in which we have some um, possibility of intermarriage and so on, so there are social linkages. And on the y-axis we have the individual family response. In a sense, their logical response based upon the framework that I just developed about what preferences of families might be relative to costs the different and, and the different um, benefits that you might have from having children. And so here, the idea is that the family, among other things, something that we haven't gotten to yet, among other things, 
part of their preference for children depends upon the preference of others. That's complementarity. People respond to the social framework in which they live and find themselves. And perhaps that's really clearly seen in terms of decision to have children or not. And so that can be seen in many contexts and very strongly in developing country um, contexts. So that to begin with, we can say that there's some kind of complementarity. That is to say, when others are having more children, our family decides to have more children also. But what we can also see, if we look at this a little bit further, is that there may be an S-shaped relationship in which there can be some increasing returns in our response after a while, but later that levels off. Later on, we have a situation in which now there's some kind of diminishing returns. And so we can begin with the thought that certainly some people are just going to have children, they're just determined to have children, even if nobody else is, right? So that even if the expected amount is zero, at least some families are just going to say, well, we're, we're having a children, we, you know, we know we're different than others. Um, and so the idea is that if this um, relationship can be, um, in fact, increasing at an increasing rate for a while before it begins now increasing at a decreasing rate. The S-shaped curve relationship. So we know we have this necessary condition for multiple equilibria because we have this complementarity, but this increasing return segment suggests that there's a chance of having at least two equilibria. And as usual, we know we're going to find our equilibria along the 45 degree line. carefully, we have one possible equilibrium which relates to a low level of fertility, such as perhaps two children per family, and another equilibrium which represents very large families, say eight children on average. And so there's a positive response because of complementarity, but perhaps this response is increasing at an increasing rate at first, and then increasing at a decreasing rate later, which is described briefly in the textbook. This is um, referred to as our figure 4.1 reinterpreted. Figure 4.1, if you may recall, was the relationship between the average expected investment levels in an economy and then the individual firm's profit maximizing best response in terms of investment. And so why might we see this? So the General complementarity is just about social norms. We just respond as humans very typically to expectations and the social behavior of others around us. And so increasing at an increasing rate, it can be in response to negative impact of average fertility on wages. So there are many workers potentially in the future when the children are old enough to work and if the supply of labor is high, then wages will be lower, but also it could be response to a negative impact on the probability any one child will get a modern sector job or a higher paying job. If we have just one child and the chances are equal for any child, no matter what, of getting this job, if other families are having eight children, this is lowering our child's chance in the lottery, so to speak, of getting one of those jobs. So we may want to have more children just for that reason. And also there's some other benefit. If you have older children, they can take care of younger children. But this curve eventually, as I drew it, is increasing at a decreasing rate. And that can be, for example, impact of the supply of education and health goods. I mean, it's possible that part of that increasing, at an increasing rate segment in the response of family fertility to average or expected fertility is due to the fact that you know, if you have a large enough village, that is to say a village with enough children, there may be enough for having a school there in the first place. But after some point, education and health facilities are getting crowded, and so that becomes a negative effect. That is to say, an effect to slow this response. And then the costs of raising more children just rise relative to the benefits after your household size, number of children reaches 
a certain state. So that's why we might have this multiple equilibria also with respect to fertility choice. And so with that analysis, in the next episode, we're going to go on and talk about population policy. Thanks.